Hello, and welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I'm one of your hosts. Every week, we bring you interviews with makers of all kind from all, of the, all over the world who identify as female or non-binary. This, we, this week's guest is uh, Stephanie of Uncommon Outpost, and Stephanie is a self-described collector of hobbies and skills, doing everything from, you know, woodworking to welding to cement work to leather work. Um, she really just, I would say she's not scared to try anything. And so therefore she has tried so many things and comes up with very creative projects. Really glad to get a chance to chat with Stephanie and learn more about, you know, kind of what got her started with making and her journey into it and what she does with it now and talking about business and content. Um, so we had a grand old time chatting and I know you're going to enjoy this episode just as much as I did. Before we hop into the conversation with Stephanie, though, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Lee at Lee Runyon, Annette 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin Lefty's Woodshop, Christy Twisted Twine, Jeremy, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Rachel, Moody Makes, Bonnie, Tool Mom, Bonnie, Toolmomstore.com, Laura, Oakley Silk Company, Brandy, Studio, Obey, Lee, The Rainbow Carver, Ellen, Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your continued support on a monthly basis of the podcast, helping to make sure that this podcast happens. If you would like to support the podcast in an ongoing monthly basis, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash crafting a revolution and check out the different options over there. You, If you would like to support the podcast, but not in an ongoing monthly format, please make sure to follow along with the podcast over on Instagram at crafting a revolution and check out the link in bio there. And there's an option right there to do a one-time donation. And as always, you can also support the podcast in a non-monetary way by sharing the podcast on your social media platforms, making sure to tag Crafting a Revolution. And if you have the option, depending on what platform you're on, sharing the link also so people can go straight there and listen. All of that helps bring more eyes and ears to the podcast. All right. So without any further ado, let's head on into the conversation with Stephanie of Uncommon Outpost. Well, I like to start my podcast by asking guests to introduce themselves. So would you do that for me? My name is Stephanie. I am Uncommon Outpost on the internet. Um, and... I've actually been thinking about this question a lot because I knew it was the first one you're going to ask me, but um, I am like a collector of hobbies and skills. I'm uh, I, I've been an artist and a crafter and a maker, and I do woodworking. I dabbled in welding. I do all kinds of crazy stuff for professionally, but um, yeah, I just like to learn new things and kind of have like this like arsenal of things that I have collected over 30 something years of <laughs> making things. Right. And, uh, and I try to use stuff in like a, an unusual way. I try to mix and meld my many, many different passions, passions and like hoarded supplies to, to make something new or different or think of things in a, in a different way. That's the long, the long answer. No, that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I feel like I started following you not too long before the 2020 Workbench Con. Um, and I'm trying to remember how I even found you. You did some kind of, I think you participated in some kind of Instagram challenge. And um I was like, oh, that's really cool, whatever you were, whatever you were doing. And so I started following along. And I really appreciate all of the different things that you like bring in to your work, like the 
Charlie Brown Christmas tree was really cool this year. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. And the, um, I know you use like the dress form. What was that? And then what did that end up? Um, well, it's just sitting there right now, yeah. but um, it originally was um, a Christmas tree. I've, I made my Christmas trees for quite some time, but I made the, the tree was like a concrete bust of me. Yeah. Yeah. And then the skirt was the tree, but I made that, um, that was like my pre COVID measurements. So it's not very accurate right now, but, um, I wanted to make it out of like stone and I'm not Michelangelo, so I can't like chisel marble also who has a block of marble. So I made it out of concrete. And, um, the idea was that I could use it to wet form leather to mm -hmm. make like, I'm sure you're aware of that. Like things aren't made for women, no. like aprons. Right. Like I had like a, I, my original plan was to make an apron because I wanted like a wet formed apron. So I didn't have like that boob flap where like yeah. chips yeah. go and yeah. dust yeah. and things. And you're like, what in the, in, yeah. in a, you know, I wanted it to be more tight fitting. Also, you know, if you're using a lot of power tools and you have like dangling fabric, yeah. that's not a good idea, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I still haven't done that yet, but it's on the, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then of course, like, I absolutely still love like your workbench and like the shoes with the, uh, outline sketch onto it. Like that is just awesome. Um, Thank you. yeah, <laughs> I really want to go more into that, like that, um, design feature. I really want to, um, you know, embrace that a lot. And I want to make my whole workshop look like a cartoon, mm -hmm. but we're, we're in a rental house and we just found out like, like a week ago that we have to move. So I, um, I've got stuff everywhere and I'm trying to yeah. not start any more projects and just right. finish the ones that I have or get them movable. And so, um, so hopefully soon we can buy a house and then I can, you know, cartoon the whole workshop and like, that would just be awesome. <laughs> I can't wait. I have a pair of like the white dovetails, the pants, and I was like, yes. I'm going to make cartoon pants. Um, and then I'm like, that's going to look ridiculous. Like I can't just wear that around town, but I probably will anyway. <laughs> no, you totally need to do that and wear them around town. <laughs> I have them. They're sitting right there and I'm like, should I wear this to work? And I'm like, no, no, that's, it's too far. No, to, no, like, please do. It's please too, do. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't even painted them yet, but I'm like, is too far you're taking it too far in public like public is at home and on the internet is one thing but like in front of real people is a totally different thing but I mean I could totally see like once you get there once you reach that goal of like the cartoon shop just that like aesthetic as like constant background on a YouTube channel would be amazing like I think I would love it I know <laughs> And th there's an artist in, um, that does like kind of like a line drawing type thing. And people have been sharing her to me. She had a big installation last month and I cannot remember her name, but I'll get it for you. But, um, people have been sharing it with me. I'm like, yes, I know. That's exactly what I want my life to look like <laughs> because like my brain is so cluttered and I have so many things. I want to have like a studio space. That's just like purple lines and white. Yes. But, yes. We'll see. Um, Okay, now that I like geeked out over your work, I want to take a second to like step back and just uh, ask like the broader question of what is the story of Stephanie from like baby Stephanie? Like where did you, you know, grow up to how did you get into this whole making, crafting stuff? Well, my maker story is kind of like my life story. They are one and the same. Um, because, you know, I, um, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia in like a, like a middle-class suburb dad, two girls, dog, public school, you know, like the American dream. Right. And, um, <laughs> And it was awesome. But, um, and my parents are both very hands-on people. Like my, my mom was, um, you know, she was raised like more rural, her family's Mennonite. And, um, and she, like her, her parents, like 
they had restaurants or they um, trained racehorses and they, they lived in the mountains in Virginia. And then, um, so she moved to the big city to get a new life, the big city of Richmond, Virginia, right. you know, huge metropolis. But, um, and then my dad, he, um, he grew up in Richmond and he's um, like his depression era parents are very, you know, like, why would you pay somebody to do something right. that you could do? Like, don't throw anything away. You know, um, I, that's where I get it from. But, um, you know, I grew up like my mom made like all of our decorations, our clothes. If we need furniture, my dad made it. He made like um, all the additions on our house, like anything that needed to happen. We did it ourselves. Or if we didn't know how to do it, like we had a a friend like oh like mike mike is a you know my dad's brother mike is a mechanic and his buddy cliff and repair any appliance and you know like we didn't go places to get things done like i mean i bought jeans at the store and stuff but like my mom made all our dresses um i made my prom dress for in high school like i made all of the things and like i grew up in the woods catching snakes and like building things and playing with legos and making american girl doll dresses and baking and sewing and like just i did all the stuff and i didn't know that other people didn't do that because you know you're raised you know your life is very small you know and pre-internet like you don't know (laughs) even your friends down the street like i didn't know my friends bought their furniture i just assumed everyone built it Mm -hmm. you know and um and like my sister was super girly and I was a tomboy um and I hated pink (laughs) and my sister loved everything pink like my sister didn't wear pants until she was like seven she only wore skirts and dresses okay and I wanted to be like a farmer or a cowboy or a hairdresser when I was a kid you know Mm -hmm. so um you know that that's kind of how I was raised I grew up like that and like um, like I wasn't, you know, uh, I didn't really like have an idea of, you know, who I was for a very long time. And, um, I just kind of did, I didn't have any brothers and there's no kids my age that were girls in my neighborhood. So I just hung out with the boys and I built forts and like when my dad's building stuff and he needs a hand, like that's me, I'm the oldest. So I'm there building the thing with him. And he would like give me a little hammer and I'd have like my free range of the scrap wood in the garage and like, you know, the Folgers can of old nails. Yep. And that was mine. I had like a right. little trim hammer, like a little six ounce hammer. And so I would just, you know, build stuff out of scrap wood. But I mean, as a tiny girl of like eight and most of the nails he had were like 10 penny framing nails, like four inch nails. So I would nail the, I would use like the limited supply of small nails to nail things together. And then I would just like hammer as hard as I could to try and get that big four inch nail into a two by four, which I never did. And so I would give it to my dad and be like, I made you a tie rack. I made a lot of tie racks, but, uh, I remember my cousin at one Christmas, my cousin got like a real toolbox, like a wooden toolbox. And he's, he's one month older than me. And me and my sister and my girl cousin, we got dresses from Germany, my grandparents' trip. And I was so pissed. I was like, this is not fair. Right. You know, (laughs) I want a toolbox. And then, you know, later in in like high school or middle school or something, some other grandparent or somebody gave me this pink toolbox. It's like this big and uh, it's plastic. And then it's like dinkiest pink tools in it. I never have used any of them, but I keep it because one, I'm a hoarder. And two, um, it's like my reminder of like, this is what people expect of you. Yes. This, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this, but yes, you can. Um, <laughs> like this shitty pink toolbox is yes. when I say I want to build things, I get this shitty pink toolbox with like the world's crappiest plastic screwdriver in it. And like, this is what they, this is what they expect of me. And so I have it in my garage to this day. And it's my reminder of like, I'm better than this. Right. <laughs> and no girl should get this shitty pink toolbox. She unless, I will say, unless mom. they want, see, like I, my, my daughter is like dressed to the nails, like dress, uh, you know, he, her little heels, 
but like out in the shop, like using the chisel and the mallet to remove bark for me off of like, well, yeah, all that, I, I mean, know? pink toolbox I'm fine yeah. with, but like put real tools in it. Yes. Don't like, don't make it like, <laughs> like a, like a fake yes. coated, you know, yes. something that's oh, going to fall yeah, apart. Yeah. Like you can pick it up and be like, is this like play school version of something for an adult? Yeah. So, um, oh, no, I get it. I, that part, I don't. Like that's like my bitter my bitterness of a of being like a a kid that wants to learn things and then and like in my family like my dad and my right. mom are encouraging me I've always been super supportive to like they sent me to like science camp and I learned how to make a pinhole camera and I went to art classes and I did all the things that wanted to learn all the stuff and they encouraged that mm -hmm. but outside of my home it was not that way mm -hmm. and so um you know, I, uh, were you, did you grow up in the, I'm trying to do the math, eighties, late eighties, early nineties. Is that when you well, were, I was, of... I was born in the eighties. Okay. Like, so I, I feel like that's I grew a up, bit, I guess in the nineties. Yes. I feel like that was sort a of. Bit of the time period. Cause I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was born, like, like I was born in 81. So yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I would say I was encouraged at home in the sense of like, I had all the Legos. Um, but beyond that, like, to this day, my mom still continues to try to get me into a dress. So it's like the fact she just like, you know, doesn't compute like, no, like the number of Barbies you bought me that I never touched, but I took all those boxes and built stuff out of them. And <laughs> Oh, yeah like, like yes. I did the girly things too yeah. though but like I had American girl dolls and I but I made them dresses and I right. wore dresses but I made <laughs> my own dresses right <laughs> I'm like no I don't want that one that's sparkly I want like a polka dotted one I made my polka dotted prom dress I've okay. always been a weird kid I'm such a weird kid <laughs> looking at life through the rearview mirror like I look back and I'm like oh yeah like no wonder I did that or no wonder right and I'm like how you know, just nothing made sense at the time it, why I was doing things right. and stuff. And, and looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. I guess that right. I did that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? So once you like get through like high school, what'd you do past high school? Um, let's see. I, well, in high school, I, I actually, my dad and I volunteered a lot with Habitat for Humanity. So I did a bunch of like building missions and I went and like rebuilt houses after hurricanes and stuff. Cause that was like our thing that we did together. And so I really liked building and I wanted, and I, and I really liked art, but I can't draw. I've never been able to draw. And in so middle school, all, who was doing the whole cartoon thing. Well, that's that. like okay. lines. <laughs> like I can't draw like a person or a thing. I can draw a lot. I'm a real good tracer I can trace okay. like nobody's business, but I can't just <laughs> draw something. Gotcha. Um, so I did art in middle school, but art is all drawing in public school because I'm mm -hmm. funding to do anything else. So I did photography in high school and the photography class was right next to the shop class. And I really wanted to take shop, but it was all boys. And I was like this like shy kid, mm -hmm. like weird shy kid that like dressed all in men's thrift store clothes from the seventies. And like, I like had my own personality, but I wasn't like at that point, to put myself like completely out of my comfort right, zone. Right. So I never took shop. And, um, and like I was graduating high school and they're like, Hey, you know, my, my, my mom, my dad were like, you know, you have to go to college. You don't have a choice. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not ready. I don't know what I want to do. And they're like, no, well, sorry. Tough. You're right. with it. <laughs> And I was a really good student, but I wasn't, um, but I had to work really, really hard. Um, I have like, I have ADHD pretty bad, but it was undiagnosed until like my, I was almost 30. Mm -hmm. And so I worked really, really hard and I got really good grades, but, um, I didn't realize that I was doing so much more than everybody else. Like everything that came easy to all these people. Like I still got good, good grades, but like I had to work so much harder than everyone else. And that's kind of how like my, it's shaped who I am as an adult, because 
I'm so used to being overwhelmed and stressed and anxious. That's just how I live because I've lived that way since I was a kid. And so, um, like I was thinking about this the other day, like looking again, looking back, like I didn't do great on tests. Like I can't memorize anything. Like Mm -hmm. I forget everything, but I did killer projects. Like I would make like elaborate costumes and do a presentation. I'd like build something crazy. And I always got like 120 points on my project. So it brought up my low test average. And so I was a good student and I'm looking back at photography and I'm like, oh yeah, I chose everyone's like, oh, go to college. What's your favorite class? Uh, photography will be a photographer, go to art college. So I did, but it wasn't the taking the pictures that I liked. It was playing with the chemicals and the machines in the dark room. I didn't realize that until like a week ago. That's why I liked photography so much. (laughs) You know, it was, it was tinkering with all the stuff and like, you know, and, and that's what I like to do and like learning how things work. And so I went to, um, the Savannah college of art and design for photography And, um, my sophomore year, uh, they were like, Hey, you know, we gotta be real with you. I know you guys all want to work for national geographic or something, but that's not gonna happen. Like maybe two of you will, the rest of you are going to be taking Olin Mills high school portraits for the rest of your life. And I was like, what? (laughs) No, that doesn't sound fun. (laughs) So I switched majors. They had this new advertising program. Um, and they were looking for people to be in it. And so I was one of the first like 10 kids to be in the SCAD advertising program, which is a huge thing now. But when I started, like there was no digital advertising, Mm -hmm. we did billboards, we did newspaper and we did radio and that's it. Um, like no web, no TV, nothing. Um, like I had all these friends that were in like industrial design and furniture making, And I, I'm like, I want to do that, but it's all drawing. It wasn't anything Mm -hmm. three-dimensional. It was draw this thing and submit this Mm -hmm. beautifully drawn car for industrial design. I'm like, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I like barely passed any of the drawing requirements. Um, I'm like, I can't, I can't be a furniture maker because I can't draw a chair. And so I did advertising, which involves graphic design, which involves a lot of drawing. And I was very bad at it. And so <laughs> and like I, I graduated, but I am terrible graphic designer. Uh-huh. And I would have all these like crazy ideas for ads and I just couldn't execute them because I don't know how, like, just don't know how to do them. And it was really like weighing on me. Like I, I started just like doing really easy stuff. Cause I knew I could execute it. And like, I'm like, I can't, Mm-hmm. I can't do these things. Cause I, like, I have a great idea, but I, I can't draw enough to make it happen. And so when I graduated, I did not go into advertising. Um, I, if I could have majored in color theory, I would have, that was my favorite class. Like, uh, I, I should have done something different fibers or, um, now they have like user experience design and like all this crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. They have like theme park design. I'm like, where was that? You know, I would love to build roller coasters. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, I have had a job since I was 13 and I worked my whole way through college as a bartender. Um, and so, you know, again, used to being overwhelmed. So I was in school full time in art school, which is not, not an easy thing to do, especially when you have undiagnosed ADHD. And then I was bartending every night in like, the kind of shady bar that will let an 18 year old bartend. Right. (laughs) You know? And so, um, when I graduated, like everyone's moving off to LA and New York and getting coffee in advertising jobs. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I'd had a graphic design internship and I didn't like working in office and I didn't, I was like, I can't do this. And I was making a bunch of money bartending because, you know, because I'm charming Mm -hmm. and, um, (laughs) And so, you know, it turns out I am really good at getting paid to watch football and make fun of people. So, uh, (laughs) and like, uh, Savannah's a military town. Uh, you don't know that necessarily working on it, but there's a lot of army bases nearby. And so, you know, um, Hunter army airfield where like the Ranger battalion is, is there. And so you have like, I don't know, a couple thousand of like super hot buff 20 something dudes all coming in thinking like they're the hottest shit of everything right. that's ever happened. And I, um, all the confidence I lacked 
in early life, I gained being behind a bar. It's like being on stage. Like you just get that power and everyone's looking at you. And so it's sink or swim. Like you better be funny. So I had like made a character of like the super confident outgoing, like no nonsense, no bullshit type person. And I like played that character for so many years that I just became that person sort of. And, um, and so like, I just loved when some dude came in acting like they're the coolest guy in town and I had no problem letting them and everyone around them know that they were not. <laughs> and, um, and people thought that was funny. And so, you know, I, I did well there and, um, and I bought a house, a townhouse. And then, um, I bought it like a week before I turned 22. And then like three months later, uh, the crash happened. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I'm definitely not going into advertising then because when the economy's down, like the first thing people cut is their advertising marketing budget. So people are getting laid off. Like I'm, I'm not doing this now. Nobody's buying my newspaper print ads now, you know? <laughs> And so, um, I bartended for a while and, and I worked on my house and I did all these things. And, um, and I was like, you know, uh, they let me kind of just like make elaborate Halloween decorations and like do all this stuff. And Savannah's like a, like a bigger, small town, like everybody mm -hmm. in the service industry knows everybody. Cause it's a, it's a tourist town as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, these folks were open at a country bar and they're like, Hey, we want you to come do this, like run this country bar and like do the menu and like help us book the bands and like do all the things. And so I did that. And, um, I ended up running that bar and like, it was awesome. Like I got to do like some really ridiculous stuff, like launch a bunch of brands with Jack Daniels and like have all these like famous country music people come in and like ride mechanical bull. And like, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. And, um, and then the company I'd worked for before for a while, the sports bar, they, um, they saw me and they're like, Hey, you know, we really want you to come do all these marketing and promotions for us because you're taking all of our customers away. And, <laughs> and, and I love my country bar job, but I was also tired of having to like be there at five o'clock in the morning, counting $20,000 in ones. Cause that's like, sucks. <laughs> yeah, it does. It sucks. And, uh, and I, and I'd never had a weekend off in my entire twenties. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it'd be cool to know like what normal people do on a Saturday. <laughs> like what is, what even is that? And so I took this, I, I also, the other factor was, uh, insurance. Um, they, I had private insurance and that was exactly the time where they decided, you know, you can't, um, you know, like they changed all the laws for insurance. And so since you're a woman of childbearing age, they assume you're going to have like seven babies every year and they charge you $800 a month for insurance. And I can't afford that. So I had to, I switched jobs basically for insurance and that job was awesome. And I like taught beer classes and, and like, um, whiskey classes. And I did all these big promos for bars and liquor companies. I hosted trivia for like 10 years. And, um, and so I would get to come up with the most absurd promotions I could think of. And like the stuff is usually pretty successful because drunk people will do anything for a free t-shirt. <laughs> and so as long as I had like prizes, I would get people to show up. And so they would let me like, I'd be like, Hey, it's father's day. So we're going to get not your father's root beer to sponsor a Maury Povich. You are not the father father's day wet t-shirt dad bod contest. And I need you to pay me to do this. And they were like, okay, cool. Yeah. Let's put that on the radio and get the radio. I'm like, seriously, it would come up like the dumbest things I could think of just to, at that point, I'm like, it was just a challenge for myself. Like, right. you know, and like, I work with this Terrapin beer company here in Atlanta. Um, and they, uh, they have a beer called high five. IPA. And I was like, I'm going to have a highest high five contest and we're having everybody jump up. So you as the highest high five over the whole summer. And like one of the Gronkowski brothers was in town and they're like seven and a half feet yes. tall. Yeah. And he like <laughs> jumped up to the, you know, and I was like, I can't believe this is my life. Like, this is what I'm getting paid to do is put finger paint on adults and have them high five 
this wall that I've built. So, you know, it was really fun, right. but you know, again, not, not super sustainable. And I was like renovating my house and doing all this crazy weird stuff. And then, you know, I've rambled for the entire hour no, already, but no, no, you're, you're good because I think it like, to me, it just connects all the dots of like the things you make now. I think you probably still like in your own, you know, when you're making your own stuff, like you said in your intro, like you push yourself to come up with like the craziest idea. Yeah. Uh. I'm like, yeah, that would be cool. But what if we made it like 10 times more expensive and six months harder? Right. And it was the exact same thing and nobody even knew. Right. Let's do it that way. <laughs> and that's really how I build things. <laughs> but, but it also um, explains to me, I think like, um, you know, whether you're, you're necessarily putting a lot of thought in it or not, but like how your content on social media comes across, like when you're sharing your stuff, like it's very, it all visually pops. Like, and so I think just like having experience with photography and then advertising, and then even if that wasn't like what you thought you were really doing, like, I think you do a good job of that. <laughs> in Thank advertising you. yourself yes. Thank you. that's um that's what I focused on in school like branding and like brand yeah. awareness like um that's what I because again color theory was my that was my passion right. so like how like colors influence you know the way you feel and like you know different not necessarily about designing logos because again can't draw but um but like how a brand makes you feel like the look and feel of a brand. And that's something that not a lot of people really realize. And the like beauty bloggers and like the more of the like DIY home home yeah. Yeah. ladies do a really, really good job of that. Like you look on their Instagram page and like, you can tell like, yes. this is, this is their look, their feel. This is how, you know, I mean, a lot of them are are similar because like the white space and like, yeah, yeah. Very bright white stuff is really in right now, but, um, having that, you know, that like, you just see a glimpse of something like, Oh, that's Katie's or, yeah. And that's why I wanted to do the purple, uh, cartoony thing. Cause I'm yeah. like, that's, I finally have found like, that's my look. That's, that's, that's what I'm going yeah. for. <laughs> um, Hey makers, today's episode is sponsored in part by toolmomstore.com. At toolmomstore.com, you can find any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodworker on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, and also great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout. If you enter the code maker mom, you will get a 20% discount off any of the merchandise that you buy. So that's just toolmomstore.com. All right, let's head back into the action. And this is interesting because you know, like, I don't, I think I still struggle. Like I just finally just kind of said, fuck it because I struggled for so long of trying to like make the perfect Instagram grid like what's my like brand as you say and I was like I can't like it was just stressing me out so much to like try to figure that out and so by throwing it out I think I have found yeah. my brand <laughs> like <laughs> I think your stuff on social media is a lot more cohesive now than it was when I first started following you. But yeah. I think that's because you've kind of like found your, your thing. Yeah. You know, not that you hadn't had it before, but right. like you've, no. yeah. you've really like embraced it and like stopped trying as hard. Yes. So it just <laughs> flows. More. It's more natural now, yeah. you yeah. know, not that it was forced before, but like, no, no, I you get know, it. Yeah. You're, yeah. you practiced and now you've like you're in the rhythm you know mm -hmm. yeah yes yeah, definitely and I think it's just interesting to talk about the whole brand thing um because I think like I've ha I have um 
like I've started a, a tool company. I don't have a tool yet, but, um, and so I've spent time focused on like, well, what's this brand going to be, you know, from the name to the colors, to working with someone to get the logo and like really driving to be, to be cohesive from the very start so that like you get a vibe from, you know, when eventually you see a tool, one of these tools online, you'll know it's like, oh, that's that company because it always fits that vibe with the, from the colors to everything that it says. And I don't think I would have, I don't know. I don't think I would have figured that out without all the trial and error of learning what it means to be like, you are the brand. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, cause you are your brand, but yes. is your tool brand, are you, you, are you the person buying your tools or is that a different person? Uh, it's aimed to be more at, you know, I would say like us, like yeah, the like women or like bakers, predominantly or women, like, non-binary, anybody with small hands is really what I'm aiming for. <laughs> and please tell me you're making gloves. <laughs> That's actually on my list. Um, yeah, we'll have to talk offline for for that. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, but that is on the list. But I hear you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, you know, but it's like not, it's not going to be me who's the brand, but to your point, like, like even the conversation about the pink, right? Like when I kind of started reaching out and getting like opinions from people on stuff, because I'm like, they're my target audience. I want to know like what they think about this. The number one thing they all said is no fucking pink. Do not no. make it pink. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and there's I wouldn't a pink have, tax. I, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have anyways because that's like pink's not my color. Um, but you know, I went the route of no, I'm gonna go for something that what makes what tends to make somebody feel like really sexy. And because I think of like I attach like I feel the sexiest when I'm working with power tools, like that's that's what gets me like, oh yeah, I'm a fucking badass. Like that's you're just like crushing it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. And like, so the like, dirtier I am, yeah. the sexier I feel. Exactly. So I'm like, I want the tool to feel sexy, right? I want yeah. it to have that vibe. And so it's like, okay, what color scheme do I go with that? And I'll just say it's not pink. Like it's not, yeah. you know, because that's just not it. Um just, I would be like, if I had to design a tool, it would be like, like matte black and brown leather. Ooh, I like that color. Going. That, that kind of aspect. I feel yeah. like, like I want it to look like, you know, like yeah. not necessarily masculine, but like, I don't know. I'm thinking of like the, like the interior of a really nice, like luxury yacht. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Not Chrome though, no, you know, but you know what I'm saying. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, like I'm like I love bright colors, mm -hmm. obviously. Right. But um, but you know, yeah, I don't know. Black, I feel like black is a sexy color. It is. I will say black is incorporated into the color scheme of the tools, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, but I think um that goes for all branding. And so like, I got to ask the purple because mm -hmm. okay? I know it's like, you got the purple hair, you got the purple, like cartoony lines, like where's the purple come from? Um, I have always, purple is like my favorite color all the time as a kid. Um, because like, do, do you have any sisters? I do. Yes. So, uh, growing up, like my sister was always pink and I was always purple and that's how like we told her yeah, so I just yeah. didn't like pink things and like right. if they if it has to be a girl color like be purple purple's right. cool I like purple and so like my mom made our dresses for Easter and stuff every year and was pink and I was purple and I just had like a purple room and like I don't know I just people just bought me purple stuff and I dyed my hair I my hair hasn't been brown since I was like 15 <laughs> probably earlier than that like I dyed my hair so much I was forbidden from dyeing the hair and the house and my mom would make me do it in the backyard with the hose because she didn't want to get <laughs> hair dye on the back. But like my hair's been every color, but um I don't know. I just 
like the purple stuck. And then especially when I was like working in that big country bar, you could have like 600 people inside. And so it was easy, like with the like studio lighting, we had like lighting from mm-hmm. like the people who owned like EDM clubs and this country bar. And they were like, we don't know anything about country, right. but they know a lot about like music and lighting. So they had like all these bright lights and the, like people could find me. And like, I'd have like a team of security guys that need to find me because somebody's doing something stupid. And so it was, I'm tall and I have purple hair. Like they can find me quickly in a crowd. Mm-hmm. And, um, and like, it's changed a little bit. Like it's been like red and orange and stuff, but for the past 10 years, it's 90% purple. <laughs> um, and when I was starting my Uncommon Outpost company, uh, I was looking to do my logo and um, and I, I was looking at like brown. I like brown was my favorite color at the time. And, and they, and my boyfriend's like, why isn't it purple? I was like, I don't know. Like all my other stuff's purple. Like, do I really have to do purple? He was like, yeah, you do. Like, you know, this, you need to do purple. Cause that's what people think of when they see you. Right. I was like, oh yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. I'd went to college for that. I should, yeah. I should know that. <laughs> and so, so then it ended up being purple and I just kind of gone with it. Excellent. Purple was always my favorite color growing up too. And it stayed my favorite, one of my favorite colors. Um, that's why I like, uh, our daughter is pink and purple. So, you know, her room is pink and purple. Um, but I try to let the purple win a little bit more than the pink. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Like, I mean, I I don't, I don't hate pink as a color. Like I wear pink. I'm cool with pink, but I don't like the fact that people like, Oh, you're a girl. You must want this pink one. No, No. I'd rather have real tree than pink. I just stop trying to force me into the pink things. (laughs) Also, if you're going to make it for women, make it designed for women. Don't just make the man one and paint it pink. Like make it, you know, I think that's the the thing that bothers me so much is they're like, we painted it pink. So now it's perfect. I'm like, no, it's no, not. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You just made it like out of shittier materials and painted it pink. Why would I pay more for that? So, so you know. Uncommon Outposts, the company, when did that start? <laughs> Uncommon Outposts started, well, I've made like 40 something businesses that have all like failed and I sold one thing or nothing is, um, again, part of, part of the like ADHD mindset, which I've learned in the last like year has affected so much of my life that I thought were like cute personality quirks, but are actually just like symptoms of being neurodivergent. Turns out I'm not as special as I thought, but, um, but you know, like, that's cool. It's good to know yourself. And it shouldn't have taken me this long, my mid thirties to figure it out. But, um, I, I'd always been like renovating my house and, um, doing all this crazy stuff and posting on Instagram, my personal Instagram. And then I, I did this flooring project where I, um, I'd done the like really high quality laminate on my, the first floor of my house. And on the second floor, I just didn't, couldn't afford to do that, but the carpet was terrible. And so I took, ripped it out and I did this tutorial. I found on this DIY blog about doing brown paper bag floors. So it's basically like paper mache and then you stain it and then you put a poly over it and it looks like leather and it's super dope. And I followed their tutorial to the letter, bought the things they said. I did it exactly the way they said, and it looked cool. And it chipped off in like a month and it looked like shit. It was so bad, Katie. I was pissed and my knees still hurt from this and crawling around on the floor, paper mache. Um, and I was just so upset because I'm like, I really, really wanted this to work. And it's not like, how are you going to post this on your blog and tell people to do this? And I had like tons and tons of traffic. It was like the top Google search for brown paper bag floors. And I was like, this, that's messed up, man. Mm -hmm. So like, like, there's no way that this worked well for this person because I did exactly what they said and it's not good. And I was like, I'm going to figure out how to do it correctly so that I can show the world. Don't do this this way. And don't like, cost yourself all this time and money that I cost myself. So I, um, upgraded my camera. I got a digital camera I videotaped it. I did like a million science experiments. I used every different type of 
poly, every different type of stain, all different types of glue. Like I went full on like, um, hyper focus on this right. thing and I, and I did it and I did my floors in it and they were amazing. And they, I ended up using Bona traffic, which is what they use for basketball courts. Mm. So like, it's not going anywhere. Right, You're not right. chipping it off with a rolling chair. Like it's, yeah. it's good. And, um, and I, and I made all these videos and then I, um, went to edit them after and realized like, they're all really bad, <laughs> like in front of the camera the entire time, it's all feedback. And then, um, and so I never started a website or made a YouTube and that was in 2014. And I've videoed every single project I've done since then. Um, and I've still never made a YouTube or written out plans for how to do anything. But I have them, and they're there somewhere. They're terrible, and that's um, where uncommon outpost comes from. And yeah, <laughs> and so, and so, and that's how that's how uncommon outpost started. And um, and I wanted to, to be able to do anything, um, any idea I had. Like I didn't want it to be limited to like sewing or leatherworking or woodworking or any right. of the things. And so, um, and at the time, um, I changed the name like four or five times. And then when I settled on uncommon outpost, I was actually in welding school in North Carolina. I had sold my house. Um, I'd had to unbuild all of the built-ins and the, like I had this like giant platform bed that was suspended by springs. I had like a workbench you could park a trailer on. Like I had all this stuff in my house that I had built because I bought my house when I was like a child right. and I painted all these ridiculous colors. So I had to unbuild all these things. I sold my house. I lost a hundred thousand dollars. And I moved to North Carolina for my boyfriend's job. And he was like, saw that I was like really struggling with depression. And he's like, why don't you take this time? And like, I had all this debt from selling the house. He was like, file bankruptcy. I'll support you. And we'll start over and try and make this, make, just do something different. Don't work in a restaurant anymore. It's like, okay. So I applied for all these jobs and no one would hire me because I can run a $5 million a year restaurant, but I can't run any other thing. So I would of course not. like <laughs> apply for jobs and they're like, I'd get through like three months of interviews and they're like, so, you know, we, we think you're perfect for this job. You're amazing. And I'd crush it. And then I get an email that's like, um, I don't think you're going to be happy with our compensation package. So we're not, we're not moving forward. I'm like, seriously, I told you. And I was like, I don't need as much money anymore. I'll work. Right. I know I have to start at the bottom. It's okay. I don't have a mortgage. It's fine. I'm like, yeah, no, we're just, we don't want you to leave. So no. So I ended up working at a restaurant again and I went to welding school and I was like, I'm just going to make making things happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I went to work bench con and, um, and that's when I was like, oh yeah, maybe I should you know, actually like, this is how you do the thing. I went to work at for the first time trying to figure out like, is making content something I want to do? Mm -hmm. Um, and that was like four years ago and I still haven't made a YouTube channel, but you know, that's not the only there. content out there in the world. Yeah. I do Instagram <laughs> things now and, um, you know, but I, I still have like, I still want to do that floor tutorial because like that's really important to me and I'm sure like a thousand people have screwed that up since I did I, and I feel like I could tutorial help because I'm like that sounds really cool and our carpet is all shit in our house <laughs> we'll look at find a way to like do something different <laughs> I'll send you a picture it's it is super cool it is very labor intensive you need I'm to sure. have knee pads but like it's, it looks really cool. And I loved it. And I wanted, I would do it in another house. I also thought that by now we would have another house. Like I didn't realize we we're going to be moving so many right. times. So, um, hopefully that happens soon. You know, okay. do you ever get in a phase where you're just like, yeah, this is like a limbo period. So I'm just gonna, yeah. you know, wait it out and see what happens. And then five years have gone by and you're like, yes. oh, I just <laughs> wasted five years of my life waiting to see what's going to happen next. And I never did anything. Yes. No, I so, totally have had those periods. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. And it's like every time I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. And they're like, oh, wait, we're moving to Atlanta. <laughs> so, yeah. But, I mean, yes. As we were talking before, you know, or maybe after I recorded, like YouTube is, 
is a beast. I've had, I started a YouTube channel pretty much as soon as I started Freeman Furnishings, not necessarily as a way to create content to like monetize the content. I was actually using it as a selling point for if somebody bought a piece for me, like they could actually see the process of it. So being like, see, it was worth this enormous amount of money because it took me this long to make it. You can watch the whole process here on YouTube. Um, That's smart. um, And it actually, I mean, I have had people, you know, buy pieces and really enjoy the fact that like there is a video out there of like that piece being made. Um, But then it's like same thing. I kind of went to WorkbenchCon like the very first one. to see like what's this business about being able to like also monetize and make money off of content because the reality of like being successful at being a furniture designer and making your own pieces and making a living off of it it's it's very difficult um and so yeah you know I've made as much as like as much as zero and as little as negative $10,000 $10,000 on things I've sold. Yes. You know, or if you count my yes. house, negative a lot. But <laughs> right. like, it's like, how much money can I lose selling this thing that I'm supposed to be making for a profit? Because it took yes. me a hundred out, not even exaggerating, like 40, oh, no, 50 hours to yeah. make. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm selling it for a hundred dollars. <laughs> right. Correct. So it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. And I also was realizing like, I was thinking about the 2008 crash and everything and thinking like, okay, eventually something like that is going to happen again. And when something like that happens again, like rich people don't spend money on, you know, expensive pieces of furniture. And so what, um, what else can I do as part of my business to like broaden all the avenues of money so that I'm not totally screwed when somebody (laughs) isn't buying my pieces anymore. Um, and so that's why it's like, I went to WorkbenchCon to find out about the content and I'm glad I did, but I definitely know, like, I jumped in and tried to do it all and you can't do it all. Um, see you and I did the exact opposite. We went, (laughs) we took the same classes. They were like, these are the 40 things you have to do all at the same time. And you were like, I'm going to do them right now. And I was like, I'm going to do all of them and get everything ready. And then when I'm ready, then I'll put it out in the world. And it's been however long since then. And I'm still haven't, I'm like, okay, you know, I haven't, I I'm, I don't know how to SEO. So I haven't built my website and like, you know, it's a company that's losing me money every month. So I can't pay somebody to make a website for a company that makes zero or negative dollars, you know? And it's like one of those, like you did the right thing and you're like, I'm just going to put it out there and I'll go and I'll get better. I'm like, no, I'm like a, a you, you know, terrified like perfectionist and yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put it out there. And like, every time I even post something on Instagram, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was terrible. I should take it down. And like, how am I going to feel about that with a YouTube video? So I just won't make one. <laughs> Follow following me for all the good business advice. <laughs> How to lose money in four easy steps. Well, you know what? Last year I got the depressing news after filing my taxes that, you know, because my business is like a legit LLC and like I yeah. you know, pay taxes on it, all that stuff. Um, and I finally got the sad news of like, it's been, you know, four years of losses. You are now considered a hobby and no longer a business. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, I'm, no. I'm getting that. <laughs> I did that this year. This is my fifth year. I was like, I, I'm like, can I just like say that my business, like just not put any of my expenses in so that my business makes $4 so that technically it's not a hobby. Right. Cause like <laughs> last year it lost like $4,000. So maybe if I just make right. any dollar, then I can call it. Then they, yeah. I don't want them to take it away from me. I'm not even ready yet. <laughs> Well, I mean, they still can't take the LLC away, but yeah. And, and I'm still going to like continue to report it. Cause I'm like, yeah. And taxes, I don't get, I'm like, you require me to pay taxes on anything above 600 that I make, but to make that I had expenses, which drops it, which, yeah, I think last year I was like, I don't know. 
negative you get a like small four grand something accountant. Or, yeah. <laughs> I went to an accountant one time and I learned so much. Like she told me I could expense getting my hair dyed because it's part of my um brand. <laughs> yeah. It's yes. part of my brand. And I was like, seriously? Shouldn't be doing this myself. <laughs> you know. But um <laughs> I'm like all this stuff that I'm like, I didn't know that I could write right. off. But now that my business is like unqualified in the eyes of the law, um, you know, I'm sure it won't matter anymore. That's okay. I'm like, eventually one of these days I will make a profit and then they're going to care that I am a legit business. <laughs> so you got to keep the LLC just to protect yourself, really. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The LLC is not going away. I just, you know, repaid whatever my lawyer, whatever, hundred something dollars to keep that going. Yeah. You know, for the next I couple. need to write that check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the fun stuff you learn after you're like, let's make it a business. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, I, it's important. And you, you know, one step at a time, right? Right. <laughs> Eventually, maybe another five years from now, we can revisit this conversation and be like, see, look, like we were so like worried and now, and you'll at least have one YouTube video by that time. I'm shooting <laughs> one right now for real, Whoa. for real, for real. You have to edit this out if I, if I don't finish it. Um, <laughs> I've been working on this project with Total Boat or they're helping me with this project. I've been trying to make for like a bajillion years had this idea that's like not even as cool as I I've been playing it up because I've been wanting to do it for so long it's I mean it's not that cool but I it's one of those ones where like if I post about it then somebody with more money and time will make it before me and then mine will look crappy so I can't talk about it because it's happened like to me multiple times where I'm like no one's ever done this before and I'm showing process pictures and this guy that doesn't have another job just made it all right Right. I'm halfway done (laughs) so um I get that so yeah you know and so I'm like I cannot show any pictures of it but like there's no of course I can totally you know finish this project take a picture of it make the video edit the video and post it before Mm -hmm. work finch con um, while also doing all of the other things for my real job, you know, and that's only what, like four days, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. I have to go apologize to Total Boat at Workbench Gone too. So what? <laughs> I'm supposed, Why? I was supposed to have my yards upcycled yardstick, uh, project done and posted as a video by the end of January. Yeah. Didn't happen. <laughs> So. Well, Total Boat's good people, though, and they yeah. understand. Yeah, yes, they do. But I'll just have to be like, look, Kristen, this is the dealio. It's going to get done, I promise, at some point. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of why I made the Charlie Brown tree, because, like, I couldn't, I had done, like, 30 tests for this project, and, I, like, none of them were working, so I made the Charlie Brown tree, and I'm like, I'm using Total Boat. Like, like, I'm not just, like, leaving you. I know you gave me this seven months ago, right. and I, like, send her process shots, and I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Why isn't this working? <laughs> i feel like she's like she's encouraging me because it's something she doesn't know if it's even possible so it's an experiment but i also like refuse to fail so i will just like kill myself until it's done you know that's okay after this like fairly simple upcycle project that i'm doing like the next project i'm going to be doing with them is another like i haven't done a wooden resin light in forever like years so I'm going to do another one but I am going to be doing some experimental stuff with the resin as well so that one's going to take and it's I had the same response from her she's like well it could work (laughs) let's see if it works you know so it's like let's see if we can make it work yeah (laughs) and that's like you gotta love a company that's like yeah that's not how that's supposed to go but okay okay yeah (laughs) Um, I mean, well, let's be real. They also understand the fact that even if you share like the failed attempts of what you're trying to do, like if you share that on Instagram, that's still like giving them traction, right? It's still giving yeah. them like eyeballs on their product. Um, and then if you, are, when you are successful at what you're trying to do, 
you've just like encouraged a bunch more people to go out and like try something crazy with their product. So it is, yeah. <laughs> it is definitely no. smart marketing on their behalf. I wish I'd been posting about this the entire time I've been making it because like I, the fails have been like so epic, like <laughs> really bad. And I have like the actual project is a table. So it's big and I've been making many tables. So I have like probably 20, like excellent tables in my garage, just taking up space because I'm like, I'm not throwing away my, tra- my practices until I go to make the video. Cause I like, I want to be able to share yeah. that. This is yeah. not, this is not something I did the first time. Oh like, yeah. I totally you know. need to. Like, I think people miss out on the, I think people m- tend to look especially at Instagram more than any of the other social media they tend to feel like you have to post like the perfect thing there yeah. and I think the reality is is we all for one then that becomes the standard that everyone compares themselves against and it just creates this bad cycle of like well they're perfect so I can't do it just as well as them and the reality is like you said like you've had all of these trials and failures and sharing that lets people be like, oh, okay, for one, you're real. For two, like, it helps them learn, too, of, like, yeah. these are the things not to do when you're trying to figure this out. I'm all for sharing all of my failures, but I just want to make sure I can do the perfect oh, one before I, get I tell it. you yes. how terrible I am. <laughs> Especially, you know, because, like, if you're doing content only, then like share your failures live, obviously. Like if that's your thing is content. But if you're like you, where you're trying to sell your product and people like, look at her, she just screwed up like 19 things in a row. I'm not buying her (laughs) stuff. (laughs) You know, you got to have the good one before you, you know, at least have it in your back pocket, know that it's going to work before you start talking about how terrible you're doing. Correct. Correct. Or that's my mentality. Yes. Well, uh, okay. We need to like, I'll make a note to myself to talk to you about this project though, because I have also have like a whole resin uh, table idea that's been percolating for like years. And so I want to have like a conversation just to be like, what, what are if you it's doing? the same thing? I doubt it. I doubt it would it's be not so cool if it was, if we like have been thinking <laughs> about the same thing for four years. Yes. Mine's like four years. If we've been like, how do I even do this for about the same table? I'll give you like all 30 of my tests so you can look at them. <laughs> you have to take them home with you in your car. I'm only bringing my tiny Prius, which is enough to pack all the carving tools, but I don't know if I can fit like 30 tables in addition to the carving tools. They're very small <laughs> tables. They're like more stool size. And don't worry, they'll probably collapse most of them um, anyway. So no worries. Okay, okay good. <laughs> um, well, Stephanie, we are like at the end of our like chat together. And so I want to give you another chance to let people know like how they can follow along with you and see eventually the, you know, your project when you get it done and yeah. all the other cool stuff you've done. Well, I'm on um, Instagram and Facebook at Uncommon Outpost. And, um, I have a YouTube, it's uncommon outposts and I have a domain a website that's been under construction for years. So you can go to that too. <laughs> bookmark it, subscribe to me. I have like seven subscribers. So you could be Excellent. in the original 10. There you if go. you get in now, <laughs> no pressure. Time is running out because Katie's going to subscribe because she's going to feel guilty about it that's if it. she doesn't, so, <laughs> um, you know, and there's like a, you know, three percent chance that when does this come out that this there will be a video when this comes out we'll have a conversation about that here okay yeah (laughs) um so yeah check out my brand new um total boat table on youtube it's the new hotness sleeping internet (laughs) you're gonna feel left out if you don't see it that's right (laughs) and then eventually we'll get that flora um, yeah, maybe, um, you know, maybe I can, I'll come help you, Ooh. you know, I have, to I should have talked about I, wall I control to, and my job first. I have to take time off of to do that. I need the picture first so I can convince my wife that it will look good and it's yeah. worth like, you know, the time. I think there's some pictures on my Instagram, but I will send one or at least a couple to you so you can mm-hmm. see. Okay. It actually looks really good really cool it looks like aged leather Mm -hmm. it's pretty dope 
Yeah. And it's super durable and you can clean it really easily. Will it stand up to dogs? That's um, yeah, I had an Irish wolfhound. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, seven foot tall dog with right. nails that are like actual 10 penny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, see, we recently, we had, we have old man dog terrier. He's like tw- going to be 12. We have two cats. And then like two and a half weeks ago, we got our new puppy who is a border collie mix. So he is the crazy one who I'm like, yeah, like I've already found four things he destroyed this morning. So <laughs> today, <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, in my old house, I take, I took some like PVC fence, like, mm-hmm. you know, that you put, and I built a actual fence in the living room with a gate wow. on it instead of a kennel, I had like a white picket fence and then my giant dog would just like hang out behind the fence and like go in there instead of having a crate. Yes. So that worked out well for me. I mean, if you want to go that route, well, we have, if your wife would let you put a fence in the living room, maybe, maybe we have, we have a crate and he should be in there more than he is. But sometimes I'm like, but I feel bad that he's like in his crate all day. Anyways. Yeah. (laughs) But like, it's their home. It's like their space, you know? Very true. But it does look like a cage. So, you know, it does. Yeah. <laughs> and he gives that, you know, five month old puppy dog eyes like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a sucker. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for being a guest and talking. Thank this morning. you for having me. I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. No, oh, and it was nowhere excellent. near as scary as I thought it would be. I told you. <laughs> I mean, talking to you is not scary, but like, yes, no, I get I'm it. scared. Yes. Yeah. All right. So again, that was Stephanie of Uncommon Outpost, and I'll include the links on how you can follow along with her on all the social media and make sure you get uh, signed up and subscribe to her YouTube channel so you can see that video when it comes out. I mean, she promised us, right? So the best place to find show notes is to first check the episode description on your podcast app. If you are watching this on my Freeman Furnishings YouTube channel, then check the description down below. Or you can head on over to freemanfurnishings.com forward slash podcast and find this episode as well as all the previous episodes. Um, When I am not busy making podcast episodes. You can find me designing and making furniture, home decor, uh, and wood art pieces over at freemanfurnishings.com and at Freeman Furnishings across all the social media platforms. I'm active um, most regularly on Instagram and TikTok at Freeman Furnishings. So come on over and say hi. And also make sure that you follow along with my co-host, Katie Thompson, Uh, with her projects, Women of Woodworking and Pen and Chisel, both of which you can find on Instagram. And you can also find Women of Woodworking, Pen and Chisel um, website as well. So go check all of that out. And next week, we will be back with one brand new episode uh, with host Katie Thompson. And until that new episode, let's go craft a revolution. Solution for the toxic masculinities Pollution is the constant evolution